Okay, so Wallaroo, let's address the uh, wallaby in the room. Where is all the didgeridoo? You know that I'm always uh, a little bit careful when I talk about taking a a world that references the real world's cultures uh, in its music. I'm always careful to say that I'm not a world music scholar. And so most of what I'm going to reference will be using inspiration from film, TV, video game scores, all of our sort of shared pop culture sensibility to derive some of the musical touch points for referencing that culture. So some of it's a little reductionist and some of it's, you know, downright stereotypical cliche. Having said that, if you ask anybody on any street, and that includes Main Street Australia, and ask them what defines Australian music, they will, to a person, say, Didgeridoo. 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 Anybody who I told them I was writing Australian inspired music, they're like, oh, I hope you got a good didgeridoo. Everybody, everybody. When people would say this to me, I'd say, okay, yeah, sure, didgeridoo. What else do you think of when I say Australian music? And, and there's not a whole lot of common answers. Not, not to disparage its musical validity. It's an it's a instrument that does some things in a really, really original way that no other instrument really does. However, the didgeridoo has one drawback, and that's that it only plays one note. And I don't mean one note at a time, like a trumpet or a clarinet, in, in that it's monophonic. I mean, it plays only one note. It's a fixed length instrument, which means that the vibrating column of air inside it is only going to vibrate at one frequency and maybe the harmonics of that. But generally speaking, they play one note. Pseudo orchestral music, such that I write, tends to modulate a lot where that note will not always work with everything. Now, some listeners actually pointed me to the music of Peter Sculthorpe, an Australian composer, who actually uses a didgeridooist, didgeridooer, didgeridun, utilizes a didgeridoo player in his music. I've watched some performances of uh, this composer's music, and the, the didgeridoo player had uh, actually had three didgeridoos on stage that were different uh, keys. And every time he needed to switch notes, he would move back and forth. But it's not its not like he had two of them and he was going back and forth between the two of them. It was, this section is going to be in this key. So now we modulate to this other key. So I need to grab my other one and I'm going to be playing that for at least 30 seconds or a minute. And I thought that was really cool, but I wasn't sure how to kind of encompass it in, in the music. The other large piece of context for the music for Wallaroo was that it was supposed to be at the turn of the century. So we're talking, you know, stagecoaches and cowboys and cattle ranching, Wild West outback. Now we already in the spiral have a world that's based on the American West. I took as inspiration the, the compositions of Ennio Marconi, like Fistful of Dollars and The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. I did a video on that for Pirate 101. I'll put the link up above. And I thought that world has kind of its own identity. Here for Wallaroo, we're talking about the kind of the Wild West. And again, for good or bad, we all have a particular sound in our head of the music of the Wild West. And so the other influence I thought of was Aaron Copland. Aaron Copland was an American composer and a lot of his music is synonymous in people's heads with the Wild West. But I thought in this context, it might be neat to have the Ennio Morricone West sound before the American inspired West in the spiral. And Aaron Copland's composition style could reference more the uh, Australian Wild West. The I wonder what the adjective for being of Wallaroo. Is that Wallarooin? Wallarooski? We may never know. So when I was given this assignment, this track came out before Wallaroo did as the kind of little teaser that King's Isle releases before each world. And I wasn't given any real hard guidance except it can sound uh, Western. They didn't want any guitar in it. That would sound a little too much like Cool Ranch. So I thought about Aaron Copeland, like Rodeo, which is there's another uh, film score by Aaron Copeland called The Red Pony. And that's where I got a lot of the approach to mainly the melody and harmony uh, around what we're hearing. So here it is. This is the Wallaroo Ranch Combat.
there's the loop. Didgeridoo sounds are but ones that really cut through a mix are fewer and further between. My go-to up to this point when I've used Didgeridoo has been a library from 8DO just called Didgeridoo. Uh, but I found a new one from a smaller uh, company called Simple Samples Audio that's just called Aboriginal Didgeridoo. Uh, and this one cuts a little bit harder through the mix. So I mixed these different patches together into this uh, audio just because it was easier to, to EQ and compress and, and get it into the mix like that. So I did reference this. Uh, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I did reference this uh, symphonic destruction sound. It's, it's a neat little loop that just kind of, I use it for inspiration. And I think it was the first thing I found to try and get the uh, the horses galloping, as it were. And the string part came out of that. So that you can tell that the rhythms are, are the same uh, between the two of them. I did notice that once the horn started playing, that symphonic destruction loop was a little, was crowding everything out a little bit. So I took that uh, out in the middle there. You can see the notes are grayed out. Copeland wrote some amazing woodwind parts. Just with a lot of uh, direction and motivation and just a lot of fun parts. Also, uh, the xylophone that's mixed in there. This is from Symphobia, and this is a masked woodwind patch. So it, so it has like bassoon down at the bottom. It starts layering in some oboe as it gets higher. And this particular patching also includes the xylophone starting right there at G3. And I think that's very reminiscent of Aaron Copeland's orchestration with woodwinds. Quite often, woodwinds take a minute to speak, right? Foo, 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 foo. You get it. Clarinetists and double reeds got to get that reed vibrating first. And so sometimes the sound cannot really have the attack you're looking for. So the xylophone is a perfect... Um, a solution for that particular problem of the woodwind. So having a woodwind patch that combines the ranges of a lot of different woodwinds. There's also some flute in there too. Got some bass clarinets, maybe some contrabassoons down at the ultra low end of it too. So right here at the beginning, they're helping the strings. And again with Copeland, uh, he uses French horns a lot, uh, which might explain why I needed three different horn patches. To uh, let me start down here. So some of the parts that I wanted it to sound more like a solo, I'd use the horn solo patch here from Cinebrass. And then there's another patch that has two horns playing in unison. I use them together so it sounds more like a full section. So that's two, and here is combined. We get the best of both worlds. This sound up here, um, I'm trying not to spend so much time talking about uh, my library sounds because it's getting a little redundant at this point. But this patch here, I picked up a few years ago from Sample Mod, I think it's called Sample Modeling. And this is called the French Horn, and it came in a library also with tubas. So it's a model of a French horn, rather than just sampling the French horn in every possible tone register and attack and articulation that you could think of. Use a lot of control messages to control the sound, different sort of timbers and or, uh, dynamics of the sound. <laughs> Use the, it's weird because modulation is usually the dynamics. Uh, here it's vibrato. Because it's modeled, it's, you can do it to kind of a ridiculous degree. There's, there's even a controller for a flutter tongue effect, which is pretty specialized usage. Uh, and then. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> so it's just a very controllable French horn sound. But all three of them together here, uh, start this melody off. So I came up with that melody. I liked the the longer held out notes, but I also knew that I wanted a little feathering and layering going on. So I have the trumpets coming in, answering uh, the first phrase, and then the trombones enter too. little western horseback fanfare do love me a snare drum it's one of the first instruments i ever played in elementary school i my dad was a drummer and so i wanted to i wanted to learn how to drums and in fourth grade in the northeastern u.s uh that's when we started playing instruments so i had a little snare drum that i had to cart to school on the bus it's a nice military sound and snare with a nice loose snare and then we got I have added a little popcorn snare in there it's obviously wound up a lot that snare wound up a lot tighter and timpani was always uh, a big part of this sound you might notice these are on they're the same notes they're both d's but they're in octaves this actually lets you play left and right hand to simulate playing a timpani better. Uh, also synonymous with this type of score is gonna be the piatti, the cymbals, uh, the really big crash cymbals, and you hold one of them in each hand and crash them together. And this patch has two different sets of piatti cymbals, so to just get it a little thicker, I play a little crash on both of them. Also suspended cymbals, where you can do the rolls, One of the other um, instruments that people associate with Australia, oddly, is called the jaw harp. It has other names, but basically, I'm, I'm sure it could be made with other stuff, but it's a, a piece of bent metal and it has a sort of twangy piece of metal in the middle. And you sort of put it in your mouth and you bite down on the outside and then you can f flick the little, this is the official name, the flingy piece of metal in the middle. You flick that back and forth and it makes a don 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 sound. And then you, you can shape your mouth into different vowel shapes and it will change the sound. I looked it up. Australia is one of the only two continents where the jaw harp was not thought to originate, but it did travel. It was in uh, Europe and as much as a lot of Australia's settlement is, you know, Anglo-Celtic, that's probably how it got there. <laughs> Again, one note, so you know, I'm not going to put it too many different places. The fiber slap here is just a fun sound. Kind of again meant to emulate a rattlesnake it's basically a kind of a wood block that has a bunch of little strikers inside that move up and down and it's attached to a, a kind of a long curly piece of metal so that when you when you hit it, it it vibrates up and down and the up and down movement moves those strikers up and down to to make the sounds do they have rattlesnakes in? gotta have rattlesnakes in australia right probably a more terrifying version thereof like drop bears <laughs> Uh, while the brass is playing the kind of heroic fanfare melody line, it sounded a little empty in and of itself, so I wanted to accompany it with some strings here in some open voicing that I've talked about before. Usually there's an open fifth underneath and put the third uh, in the octave above. I've got these chords up here. Uh, 
That's another neat chord that I like using a lot is the add two or add nine chord where you have a pretty much straight ahead chorded uh, G minor here. And I'll do the open up an octave like that. But I'm also playing the adding the A in there. I think it gives it a more kind of introspective sound than just chord itself. It's a G minor. I mean, it's minor. It's sad, but it doesn't have a lot of doesn't have a whole lot of interest to it. We've heard minors a lot. Throw a nine in and just be like, oh, okay. Sounds like the uh, soap opera chord when the significant other is acting suspicious. And when the woodwinds come in, we're doing D major. And then that takes us into the F minor to do the melody again. This harp isn't too audible in the final mix. So thought I'd shine a light on it right now. This is a technique I like doing where you have kind of a short phrase and you throw it around in rapid succession to different instruments. Ah, yes, the temple blocks. Some more percussion. Temple blocks are big, kind of sort of cowbell looking things. Uh, but they're made of wood, and there's usually a few different sizes. So they're kind of like wooden bells of a sort tuned into different pitches. And you usually have like at least four or five, but the pitches aren't super important. It's just to kind of give you a little cloppy horse hooves kind of sound. Build back up. a little percussion section just felt right felt like something you have to ask yourself what would copeland do a little marching man kind of idea Really just sort of climbing up A and B chords just in different inversions. You can kind of do that all day. That's a neat way to kind of stretch out some tension as you're building it to try and you know pay off a loop back to the beginning. And that's the loop back to the beginning. Um, you might have noticed that there was a little bit of this was just a false start though, I think. Me goofing around with different grooves and Really, really feeling the snare drum, apparently. All right, guys, we are coming to the end of the spiral proper where we will have covered every world. I might every once in a while do a little update here and there. I have had occasion recently to revisit the Arc 1 tracks. I remixed most of them for the vinyl release that happened in December. A uh, funny story about that is I think I've seen like three people on my Twitter feed say that they, you know, that they'd received the record and I messaged all of them and said, hey, how does it sound? You know, all of them said, I don't have a turntable, so I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm still Still trying to figure out uh, how it sounds, but we did put a lot of work into that release, trying to keep the nostalgia, but you know, increase the sound quality. Cause again, that was 17 years ago or whatever. Let me know if there's any other Wallaroo tracks that you'd be interested in me covering. Wallaroo is an interesting one. It's some worlds in Wizard 101 are sort of more, more cohesive. And it's almost certainly because the story requires that the lands be on a theme. A lot of the uh, first arc, you know, Zafaria was was very consistent. Avalon was pretty consistent. Chrysalis, Polaris. And then there's other worlds that get to explore 
more different styles just because, hey, in this part of the world, you can leave this area and go to some other vibe. Lemuria would be the obvious example of that. A lot of it was made up of pieces of different worlds. So you got the heap theme doing the film noir kind of jazzy sound. You had a Hawaiian vibe in there. You had some kind of East Asia in there. Uh, and then you also had the exotica elevator music kind of 50s and 60s swinging space age kind of vibe. Um, the first one actually that I, I remember going, oh, this is sort of all over the map was Celestia. Part of the level was an entrance into Celestia from Marleybone. So there's a couple tracks that were more Marleybone than Celestia and then into Celestia. Celestia had some epic fantasy stuff and then there was like a, the Crab March. Caramel got a little bit out there where we had some heady horror kind of parts of the world on top of the, you know, fun theme parky and uh, Bavarian kind of flavor. Novus was a little all over the map because it was literally all over the map. A lot of worlds jammed together. Yeah, that's how I think about them anyway. Nice reminiscing with you here almost at the end of the musical tour of the spiral. If you have any other favorite tracks you want, leave them down below. Also on a personal note, just wanted to thank everybody because I broke a thousand subscribers uh, sometime earlier in the year or late last year maybe. That was kind of a, a big deal for me. It's a small achievement in the YouTube world, but that was kind of what I was looking to do. And it's been nice meeting everybody and, and getting to sort of share the process here. All right, everybody, have a good day. I'll see you later.